Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and giallo enthusiasts. As always, this is your host, the King in Giallo. Our first stop on our journey through giallo cinema is, of course, the first giallo film. This video will cover some technical aspects surrounding the film and its production, as well as its reception. Nothing too laden in my opinions just yet. That will follow in my review video next time. Here is... The Girl Who Knew Too Much Overview The grandfather of giallo cinema, the progenitor, the OG, 1963's The Girl Who Knew Too Much, or La Ragazza Che Sapiva Troppo, directed by Mario Bava. Bava had a successful run of directing Italian gothic horror films up to this point, but would finally turn the camera now towards modern Rome and focus on more typical people. With a title alluding to Alfred Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much, and a plot reminiscent of an Edgar Wallace-type story, and finally a killer with a modus operandi taken from Agatha Christie's The ABC Murders, the first Jello film made is a one-of-a-kind Italian thriller. It tells the story of Nora Davis, an American woman, visiting her dying aunt in Rome, who, after witnessing her aunt suffering a heart attack, ventures out into the dark streets of Rome, where she is mugged and knocked unconscious, but awakens to the sight of a young woman being murdered. Only problem is there's no corpse discovered. Nobody believes Nora, except for her aunt's doctor, Dr. Marcello Bassi, who has taken a liking to Nora. Along the way, she believes a killer behind the alphabet murders is still at large, an assailant who targeted their victims according to the first letter of their surname, and now may be targeting Nora as their next victim. Unbeknownst to himself in 1962, Mario Bava was about to introduce to the world a new style of thriller cinema. As mentioned in the Missing Limbs and Spare Parts video I did, Italy did already have numerous thrillers over the decades leading up to 1962, but this film would be the first one to embrace the style of the Mondadori giallo in terms of its tropes and overall aesthetic. This truly was the first film equivalent of a giallo paperback. Mario Bava was unconvinced of the original script, which was in fact collaborated on by Sergio Corbucci, credited as Enzo Corbucci, and Franco Prosperi, himself employed as the director's assistant at this time. And so Bava endeavored to do some rewrites to the screenplay to make it more macabre. The finished product was far from what we think of as a giallo film, but it did establish a soft blueprint of sorts, perhaps a template, for Bava and other filmmakers to go off of. Interestingly, the film is way more subdued from Bava's other cinematic endeavors up to this point, but that is not to say that this film was no less groundbreaking in what it would develop for Italian cinema, and that is a true outline for a giallo film. Common giallo tropes are established in this film. It opens on a 747 arriving in Rome, highlighting the jet-setter lifestyle that was trending at this time and exploited in these films. It centers on an American abroad in a foreign country, as these films would typically have a protagonist who was an outsider, intensifying the normally mundane obstacles to new, higher stakes, as the main character is inundated in this confusion of foreign customs, legal red tape, as well as struggling with language barriers which make effective communication all the more complicated. The protagonist in this film, Nora, is one of a kind for these types of flicks as well. She is a fan of murder mysteries and loves reading Edgar Wallace and Agatha Christie. Dare we say, meta for a film like this? Nora is equally multidimensional as she is determined in her pursuits and also fairly spunky to boot. She is the first protagonist of a giallo film, and she remains a sort of outlier against the usual cast of women who, in the future, would be cast typically for their looks alone. The characters in general in this film are a step above the giallo films which follow. This film is more plot and character driven than the typical giallo film by Mario Bava, but this does not hinder Bava in his usual foray of building suspense and atmosphere in his signature lighting and framing techniques while always keeping the audience invested in the characters who themselves are rather empathetic. For any faults the script may have, the directing and acting do work in the favor of the film. Leticia Roman stars as Nora, 
herself an Italian-American actor who had recently broken into films in the 1960 Elvis Presley movie, G.I. Blues, where she held a supporting role. And although her film career was fairly short-lived, her lead role in The Girl Who Knew Too Much is absolutely her best part played as she totally owns the character, naturally making it her own, whereas if this role was in the hands of another, it might not have come off as charming as it was. Leticia Roman involved her fellow Italian-American actor friend, John Saxon, in the film as Marcello. John was eager to go to Italy to work on the film with Bava, admittedly not knowing who Bava was at the time. Saxon had found himself in a bit of a lull, or ebb, in his career at the current moment, and he hoped that this foreign film would inject some new life into his film career. This did not happen, unfortunately, although Saxon would be seen again in Umberto Lenzi's Violent Naples, 1976, and Dario Argento's Tenebrae, 1982. Saxon excels as the lovelorn doctor who desperately tries to protect Nora, and his knack for physical comedy within the role is truly hilarious, as he tries to prove his masculinity time after time again, only to injure himself. Valentina Cortese rounds out the ensemble with her excellent portrayal of Laura. Cortese enjoyed an illustrious film career dating back to Ricardo Frida's 1948 Les Miserables to her Academy Award-nominated performance for Best Supporting Actress in Francois Truffaut's 1973 Day for Night. Dante Di Paolo was initially deemed by Mario Bava to be too young for his role, but after a screen test, he proved that he understood his part and was later cast in Blood and Black Lace. The ensemble made this film easily one of Bava's best acted films he ever put to screen. If the film is lacking, it is admittedly lacking a lot of the typical Bava-type intensity of emotion, plus it seems to be lacking any real, tangible danger. One doesn't typically watch this film in fear that Nora is in any real danger of being killed. The tone doesn't suggest that's even an option. It's too light and overtly comical, unlike later Bava Giallo films where the characters are more unsavory and the paranoid tone lends the possibilities of horrible things to happen to anybody at whim, which was often the case. Bava admits in an interview with Luigi Cozzi that he took on the directing of this film at a bad time in his life and that this likely rubbed off and made its way into the film. He had just finished special effects shots for Eric the Conqueror and was taking six months off where he was reading horror and mystery magazines and was deeply considering retiring from directing altogether in favor of just working on special effects. The producers at AIP convinced him to return, however. He says he had just had a nervous breakdown but desperately needed the money, and so he agreed to direct the film, a comedy whodunit. Bava thought the plot was silly and opted to focus more on the technical aspects of the film, mainly shooting in deliberate monochrome black and white, the final film of Bava's to be shot in this style. Black and white was considered the standard for horror films at the time, but without a doubt, the later inclusion of vibrant colors would be a staple for giallo films to come, beginning with Bava's next film, Blood and Black Lace. Regarding The Girl Who Knew Too Much, Bava has famously said, perhaps it would have worked with James Stewart and Kim Novak, whereas I had, uh, well, I don't even remember their names. Ouch. I can tell you, actors love it when you work with them for months and forget their names. Bava goes on to say that after he edited the script and made it more macabre, that the film went on to do modestly. It should be stated that despite what Mario Bava says about having nervous breakdowns, his family asserts that this is not true and an exaggeration at best. Yes, he did often work himself to exhaustion, but anything beyond? No. But we should thank him regardless for the macabre elements of the film, which would not have existed without his rewrites. In America and English-speaking territories, the film was released as The Evil Eye in 1964. American International Pictures ran these releases after associating themselves with Bava's Black Sunday, 1960, which did very well at the box office. 
The executives at AIP, Samuel Z. Arkoff, and James H. Nicholson were interested early on in the project and requested that Bava film material exclusive for the English-speaking version. Some main differences between the two cuts are, beyond numerous scenes being deleted, one bit in the original script features Nora's hallucinations being influenced by her unknowingly imbibing of a joint of marijuana, whereas this version was unacceptable for the AIP release and was changed to Nora simply being oblivious to another killing as she swears to Marcello to stop reading murder mysteries. Cheeky. The AIP version also includes a cameo of Mario Bava and a photograph portraying Nora's uncle, but the public shy director chose to not include this bit in his version of the film that would play throughout his native land. AIP's version also rescores the jazzy Roberto Nicolosi soundtrack of the original for a soundtrack by Les Baxter. By the time the US cut, The Evil Eye, was circulating in theaters on a double bill with Bava's Black Sabbath, Bava himself was already working on his next giallo, the inspirationally sensational Blood and Black Lace. The film was released on February 10th, 1963 in Cagliari in its opening and only weekend where it grossed about $27,000, failing to cover initial production costs. The film to this day is Bava's least commercially successful film, grossing around 80 million lira in Italy, the production costing itself around 190 million lira. Audiences were not ready for Giallo Cinema just yet. Not until Dario Argento's The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, 1970, which some critics argued was a ripoff of The Girl Who Knew Too Much, and then also Argento's film The Cat of Nine Tails, 1971. Bava has said the film was just too preposterous. While it is the first giallo and introduces several of the cliches, the low body count and the next to no sexuality stands out against future giallo films which play way more like exploitation films or even early slashers. This film is a must watch for any fan of Giallo Cinema, or a fan of Mario Bava, or a fan of the films of Dario Argento. Thank you again for watching. Always greatly appreciated as I continue to navigate more and more this content creating landscape. I am working on all the content surrounding The Girl Who Knew Too Much for the Patreon, including the viewing, the riff track, the podcast, and the full Gialli Tally cliche counting video. Upcoming for the King in Giallo YouTube will be The Girl Who Knew Too Much Review with the final Gialli Tally score at the end. Same old YouTube drill here. Like and subscribe for more of my content. Ring the notification bell to be alerted as soon as new videos and shorts drop. Comment any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns below. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Signorina. Signorina. Parli. Che le è successo? Ah, oh, mi sa che questa qui è ubriaca. Ma guarda, è pure nuda sotto il trenzo. No.